quickly. Who knows the difference between your spirit and your soul? Right on. Your spirit is the inner person and your soul is your mind, will, personality, appetite, intellect, and will. All right, I think I said will twice. All right, the book of James. Amen. Who was James? Can anyone tell me? That's right, Danny. He was the half-brother of Jesus. He came from heaven, and all of his brothers and sisters came from Joseph and Mary. So he's a half-brother. Amen? Half of earth, half of heaven. We could say it that way, couldn't we? Amen. And what did we learn about James? Who was the last one of the family that really began to believe in Jesus? Everybody else believed in Jesus, but there were a time that hardly anybody in his family believed. They had just lost their Joseph, their father, and Jesus seemed to be crazy because he's talking about this being the Messiah. And he's, he's doing all kinds of different things. And remember, he showed, they showed up on, on the outside of the house and one of the brothers and sisters says, hey, Jesus, your mother and your brethren are here. And he says, who is my mother? Who is my brethren? But he that does the will of God. Amen. And so James was the last one to really come in line. Now we find out that James here in this position, who is he? What kind of a office does he hold? You know, who is he? He's a pastor. Amen. He's a pastor at the church at Jerusalem. And Peter is the apostle at, uh, of Jerusalem. Amen? Can anybody remember without looking at your notes uh, when it was written? 45, around 45 AD, give or take a few months. Um, another thing that you need to know, let me ask you this question. Because you love to study the word. When Jesus was approached by his disciples, they asked him, when were going to be the signs of your coming? And what are, are, how do we know? And it said, and Jesus said, there won't be one stone. You see this temple, you, there won't be one stone left upon another. You'll find that in Matthew, uh, you can find it in Matthew 24, uh, Luke 21, and Mark 13, I believe, where Jesus is addressing the temple. Now, how many times did you hear in Scripture that the Israelites were asking, when at this time are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Remember them asking that? When are you going to make us in power? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father's put in his power. So he's going back. When was the temple destroyed in Jerusalem? Come on, give everybody else a chance. Nobody heard him, but that's all right. He was completely right on. 70 AD. So if this book was written in 45 AD, it wasn't some, until some years later that Israel was overthrown by the Roman Empire, and the last fight was on Masada, which is a great big cliff that overlooked. And you, you have to read about the Battle of Masada, looking over Armageddon. But anyway, that's another story. So why I'm doing this is, is James is establishing a church in, in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, when there was never anything but synagogues. A synagogue was a temple that had three parts. I'm going I'm to cover it. So the question was, what's a synagogue? It's a place where the Jewish people met and discussed the word. Okay, it's much like a, a church today, but in the synagogue you have the outer court, you have the inner court, and then you have the Holy of Holies. In, in church today we have the fellowship hall, <laughs> we have the sanctuary, and we have the altar. Hello? In your own life you have your spirit, you have your soul, and you have your body. Your body is the outer court, your soul is the inner court, and your spirit is the holy place. Can you say amen? So there's a lot of parallels going on, but this is the book of James. I mean, I could cover so much, but I don't want to. So the book of James, this is chapter 5, okay? All right, so in the book, have you enjoyed it so far? I have. I love teaching this book. But the book of James is so neat because it's filled with New Testament wisdom. And folks, 
can you tell me what was the key revelation and fact between the Old Testament believer and the New Testament? Yeah, Denise, what, what was the difference between an Old Testament believer and a New Testament believer? What does a New Testament believer have that an Old Testament believer didn't have? Can you clarify? Jesus. Well, they believed in Jesus, didn't they? Come on, you need to clarify. Can't be just Jesus. You got to be clarification. Jesus in our heart. That's the difference. Being born again, being baptized into Christ. You get those terms down because that's the reason why there's so many people in the Jehovah Witness Hall is the Christians don't know what they believe. They got a modge podge. And so they come sweeping in with some kind of a system, and most people go, I guess that's right, I guess that's right. No, you need to know terminologies, you need to know settings, you need to know the difference between the Old Testament and the New, what is the difference between the two kinds of believers, how much Holy Spirit operated in the Old Testament as verses to the New Testament, all these things we teach just about every sermon. <laughs> so you're covered, say I got it. Amen, so let's go on. So. What have we learned so far? We're in the fifth chapter of the book of James. And without looking at your notes, can you remember the two major teachings in chapter 1, two major teachings in chapter 2, two major cha teachings in chapter 3, two major chap in chapter 4. My tongue's going all around. Two major teachings in chapter 4. Okay, now, the reason why I do it like that is so that you have enough knowledge of that book, you could answer just about any question in it. When somebody say, hey, I need to know about faith without works. What chapter is that in? And see, if you repeat it enough, you'll know basically where that's at, and you'll be able to go to it and show people. And if anything else, without you wanting to do this, people might be impressed with your knowledge of God. <laughs> Can you say amen? Poke your neighbor and say, yeah. All right. So, so in chapter one, two major themes were let patience have a perfect work. How come James talks about patience of having her work? How come James isn't talking about it? What were the Jews, Jewish mindset? Can you remember? I've told you. What was their mindset? Jewish people did not know about God dwelling in them. They asked God to come in them, but they still operated in the works of Judaism. So they had very little teaching and understanding of God indwelling them. So when James is talking to them, he's breaking it to them slowly. So he says, let patience have her perfect work because they understood patience in Solomon's day of being wisdom, you see, and patience as being in it, not being God. You see, there are things in the Old Testament that were hidden, that are revealed in the New Testament. One is inside of us, God dwells now. And you and I are dwelling in God. These things were hidden in the Old Testament. Paul says, I was chosen in these last days to reveal these truths so that you may understand who you are. Because Jesus didn't teach him. The Old Testament didn't teach him. They only alluded to them. They called them shadows of things to come. Shadows of things to come. Well, in the New Testament, it's no longer a shadow. It showed up. His name is Jesus. All right, so stick with me. I'm still in the paragraph above in your notes, okay? So in chapter 1, talks about letting patience have her perfect work. And if you do, what happens? You become mature and perfect. What's the second thing in chapter 1? You be doers of the word and not hearers only. In chapter 2, do you remember what chapter 2 is about? Not being respecter of persons, right? And that breaks it all the way down into dividing people up into colors and races and demographics. The, the devil himself divides people, gets you to judge and divide. And then the second part of chapter 2 deals with what? Faith without works is dead. Right on, Joel. He remembered that. 
on in chapter 3. Remember the two major themes, a lot of other themes, but major themes in chapter 3. How you can direct your life. That's right, Sherry. How can you can direct your life by your tongue. You ask somebody how they're doing and they go, oh, pretty good under the circumstances. What are you doing under them, Bunky? Instead of saying, I'm doing good. God's got a hold of me. Now, you might be going through something, but why tell the world? And then especially get on Facebook. Why do people do stupid things like that? Talk about their always all the time. It doesn't do any good. You'll get sympathy and attention, and then people will agree with you, yes, you are sick. And now you've got people agreeing with you're sick. Da, 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 da. Get some training. Can you say amen? If that's a little harsh with you, it's because you probably are pretty old in the Lord now, but you haven't grown much. So if that kind of is an owie, take it to heart and go to God about it. Say amen. I'm trying to be a good pastor here, not a pampering mother, okay? <laughs> we all have pampering mothers. I can be that too, but it doesn't look good on me. All right, let's move on. So in chapter 3, we found out what you can control your life by the tongue or you could cause problems. Right? And then what else in chapter 3 was it about? Come on. Huh? God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Okay, let's go to chapter 4. That, that wasn't it, but we'll go to chapter 4. Now, no, don't be sorry. You're learning. How do you learn? By, by looking and making stabs and, and, and talking. Hey, I get kicked out of two churches for having the answer. So don't be ashamed of not having the answer. Okay, it's in your notes too, by the way. And then what in chapter 4? What was chapter 4 about? Do not to be in the flesh. Now realize the Jews did not know that there was a spirit, soul, and body. Say spirit, soul, and body. They just thought a person was a whole person. They didn't distinguish their body being one part and their mind being another part and their spirit being another part because it was hidden in the Old Testament. wasn't taught. Hello? It was Paul who was a Pharisee in the Old Testament who got converted into the new. He said, I discovered that myself, within myself, I'm not good. <laughs> that there's other things in me that are. I have a spirit, I have a soul, and my body is not going to make it. And then he goes, oh, wretched man that I am. So the Jewish people here in the book of James did not have any revelation of that at all. So when they fought, they fought. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If you spit on them, they spit on you. I'm serious. You think I'm kidding. If you insulted them, they insulted you, and then they had the family insult you. You see? They completely are fighting and roaring, and boy, because this is what we're going to read in the fifth chapter. It's even worse. But because of the flesh, they had no revelation that God is supposed to help us with ourself. Look at your neighbor and say, God is helping me with myself. God is helping me with myself. I'm under construction. Otherwise, I'll be under destruction. God will strip you right down to your bare bones. Now, sing, listen to me. There's a, there's a, a scripture I want to I deal with hard scriptures. But there's a scripture that says, when you meet God, you fall on the rock. And when you fall on the rock, you're crushed. Okay? Now, I know it sounds strange. But if you don't fall on the rock and get crushed, then the rock's going to fall on you and it'll crush you to powder and you'll be blown away. So what it really means, I know it sounds really... If you, when you meet God, realize that he's more powerful than you can fight, you need to surrender to God. So you fall on the rock. Who's the rock? Jesus. When you fall on the rock, he destroys your old man so the new man can come up. Glory to God. But if you refuse him to rebuild you from the inside out, he, your whole life is going to bring you 
smash you into powder. That's why you're not getting healed. You're not getting answered. You're getting frustrated. Your mouth is filled out of abundance. Your heart, your mouth is talking all negative stuff because you're not in the word. You're not in prayer. You are what we, you call a parasitical Christian. You, you feed off everybody else's prayers. No. If you've been saved more than a year, you better learn to pray. If not, come see me and we'll develop it in you. That's the most powerful tool of transformation we have is sitting with God first thing every morning and have him operate on you. Say amen, somebody. If not, get mad at me and spit. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> We're talking to people in the camera too, you understand? Not just you guys. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and they're all over now. There's lots of them. So we want to do lots more. Amen. I want, I want a message to stir people to stop playing church. We got to meet with God. He's getting ready to get his bride home. Like we're like those, those bridegrooms and, and bridemaids getting ready for the bridegroom to come and get his bride. We got to prepare ourselves and get ourselves ready. And James is trying to do this with the Jewish people. They haven't got a clue, bless their heart. And then we got Christians trying to be Jewish people. And they hadn't even got a clue. When Messiah showed up, they killed him. You want to follow people like that? It's sad. Because that was their Messiah. All right, moving right along. Go with me to Matthew, uh, Mark 10, please. All right, we're going to be moving to chapter 5. So stick your finger in James chapter 5. But i got to do a prelude about rich people, okay? Everyone say, I'm rich. I'm, in, I'm rich with God. He prospers me. Keeps me healthy. Keeps me operating in wisdom. Now, do you believe that? Say in Jesus' name. Amen. That's what he's supposed to be doing with you. He's supposed to be leaning on him. He's your shepherd. He's guiding you. So uh, this is a story about a rich man and Jesus dealing with the rich man. It sets us up for chapter 5 in James, okay? All right, you got it? So you can read along with me or you could just listen. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 says, Now as he was going out on the road... One came running and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may have eternal life? Good question, right? And so do you think Jesus was impressed? Well, yes, he was. He actually was. But remember, Jesus always ministers to the heart, not to the flesh. Say the heart, not to the flesh. Okay, maybe, maybe you got that, maybe you didn't. Okay, so Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? What did the guy call him? Good. Well, what did Jesus say? Why do you call me good? There's no good but one. Who's he referring to? Jesus is referring to his father. Why did he say something like that? Amanda, can you tell me? Exactly right, because he's not to draw any attention to himself. That's a message to you and I. When we do something for God, you're not to do it to be seen of men. You're to do it to, be, to please God. Even if you did a crappy job, you do it with all your heart, it will please God. Because you're doing it with all your heart, maybe it's not perfect. Do you understand? You get up and you say, okay, God, teach me how to do it better. And there's where the fun comes in. You never did anything, never painted anything, never put anything together, and all of a sudden you ask God, and suddenly it's together. Joe did that down the swing set down there with, with the kids. It was very impressive. One time I backed, it, backed my truck up to the stairs, going to my back deck, smashed both the railings. Joe put it back together. I was very impressed with that. But then I'm going to just tell you, there are certain things with me I better not do because I can't do it. So I either ask God and do something like Joe did and put it together, or I don't ask God and I make a mess. 
but it's always best to act and operate with your God's wisdom. Can you say amen? All right, so let's go on and look at, look at. So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. You know that the commandments do not commit adultery, he says, do not murder. Remember the guy was asking, what must I do for eternal life? Don't forget that question. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And, he, and the man answered, and he said, Teacher, all of these things I've kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, did what? You see, he did love that guy. He did care about that guy. Right? He was impressed. Look, and he loved him. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack. This is what everybody's is scared. We're asking God, everybody. Help me, God. Show me what I'm lacking. Show me how to grow. And then what he does, we get offended. <laughs> because he might show you through your husband or through your wife. My wife has been blessed of God many times. <laughs> I love you, honey. All right. So, but look, look what happened to this guy. Come on, follow along. Don't lose me. Let your mind wander. You're the king of your mind, aren't you? Okay. And Jesus, looking at him, said to him, one thing that you lack, go your way and sell whatever you have and give to the poor. Now, okay, and you will have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at the word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Folks, don't you know if you give to God, he's going to give back to you more than you gave to him. And here's the, here's the big situation you might not know. Jewish people know this more than anybody in the world. You can take a Jew, might not even love God. He knows how to tithe. Have you ever met a poor Jew? Excuse me, I'm not putting them down, nor am I trying to be racist or anything. I hate that word. But I've never met a poor one. I've never, never met a stupid one. One that goes, oh, 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 I can't figure out my own finances. No, they're sharp. And through all that tradition, through a thousand or more years, being a drummed in them, hello. And Jesus said, why is it that the children of the kingdom seem far ignorant compared to the children of the world who know how to commerce things and make money? It's in the scripture. You should have your assets together, and if anything, use them, and then when you wore them out, pretty them up, sell them, and get some more assets and make a profit. Come on. You're always supposed to be gaining ground, even in football. You know what they tell you? When you get tackled, fall forward. If somebody hits you, don't fall backwards. Fall forward. You're going to gain ground. You see it? We're all going to have tough times. Keep going forward. Moving right along. So, he went away sad. A couple of points. Notice Jesus looked at him and loved him. That's how God loves everybody. Except the devil. He doesn't love the devil. So, Two, what was the problem that this man had? Anybody? Bueller? Huh? Greed is a good one. Can we define that a little bit more? Love of money. Do we have a scripture that we can find? The love of money is the root of all evil. Do you know where that came from originally? It came from originally. It came from Satan. Satan loved this planet so much, he declared war when he found out that this planet was made for mankind, not angels. And he says, I am God's number one Number two, man, how dare him pick an inferior person? And he declared war. And we've been having trouble ever since. <laughs> Hello. Moving right on. So what was the problem? The man had money. Is that a problem? No. Our sister said greed, but the money controlled him. Did you know people will kill for money? Sure, and it doesn't have to be a lot nowadays. The idea is greed, money, lust, you know. But God says, hey, to this man, 
you know that if you take your possessions and you give to God, he's going to give unto you more than you know. This young man knew that. How do you think he got so rich? But what was taken over? The very thing Amanda said, greed. And it sealed off his mind, and all he could think about is more and more and more. It's called hoarding. You can't give up anything. Now, I'm not talking, hoarding doesn't have to do with hoarding things that are like, <laughs> no, it could be hoarding cars, could be hoarding golf clubs. I mean, it doesn't matter. When you're, when you're keeping something more than you need and you refuse to be on the giving side of it, you got a spiritual problem. And this kid did. So let's point it out. goes down further, verse 23, Mark 10. Then, then Jesus looked around and said, the disciples came to him and said, then how can anybody be saved, Lord? And you know that Jesus said, well, he's going to say, with man, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. We haven't got to that part yet. So Mark 10, verse 23 says, Then Jesus looked around and said to the, his disciples, These are his closest men. Okay? How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? Okay? He, he just made the point. Then he says, And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, he clarifies, children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches instead of God to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through an eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, there's two answers to that. Number one, a camel cannot be pushed through an eye of a needle. Everyone say it's impossible for a rich man to save himself. That's what he's saying there. It's impossible for a person to save himself. Whether they're poor or rich. Do you get it now? You cannot save yourself. That's why we ask Jesus in our heart. And that's why you don't go one or two days. Without praying and talking with Jesus. Because then you take matters in your own hand. And you get sick again. Or something else happens. Jeez. You meet with them daily because that's how bad we are when we start off. Hello. You, the older ones are supposed to be anointed and powerful and almost in a prophetic, powerful house of ministry. And the younger ones, we got a lot of learning. But the younger ones see the older ones moving in power and they try to emulate and they go right out and fall off the ladder. <laughs> No, just let God work you right up. Pretty soon you'll be so full and so blessed. Amen. We're going to see this in the latter part of chapter 5. But we got to get there first. Okay, let's go on. And he says, and Jesus answered again, said to them, Children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches enter into the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 26 and they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? 27, but Jesus looked at them and said, With men, it's impossible. You can't save yourself. But with God, all things are possible. Hello. Did, did God save any rich man? Did Jesus ever minister to any rich people? Sure he did. Yeah, did you know that uh, Mary and Martha, not, not Mary, mother's, the mother of Jesus, the other Mary, and Martha had the lands and properties and they gave it to Jesus' ministries? Jesus wore a robe that was made out of one piece of stitching. Probably today would be worth about $10,000. We think Jesus was a pauper. No, Jesus was a godly man, and he didn't hang into the earth. So he says, birds have nests, and foxes have holes. I have no place to lay my head on this earth. On this earth is what he meant. Okay? But he certainly had a place from heaven. Can you say amen? And he certainly wasn't poor. Hello? If Jesus was poor, why did he have a treasurer? Who was a thief? And he didn't care. He tried to save that man, and that man messed up. Maybe God's trying to save us. We better be paying attention. 
Okay, all right. Just some things to think about. All right, go with me to James chapter 5. While you do that, what did he mean when it is impossible with man to get saved? Can anybody tell me? Besides my wife and Danny. Right. We, by our own righteousness, we, can, we, we have done, we can't save ourselves. Right. If we could, we wouldn't need Jesus, right? And can a camel go through an eye of a needle? Now, there is a story. I don't know how true it is or not. It might be true, but it might not be true. But I do use it sometimes. In the wall of Jerusalem, there is a little place called the eye of the needle near the, um, the sheep uh, gate. It's a small opening that people at night, they get caught at night and they come in late. If they're just one person, one camel, they can actually unload the camel, get the camel in on its knees, and then lead the camel through the little hole in the wall and then seal it off. The idea is the large gates are open in the day where they can protect them, but when there's night caravans and stuff, there's robbers and thieves and everything like that. So they did have a little gate that they supposedly nicknamed Eye of the Needle. Okay? But what Jesus is really saying is a man cannot save himself. Plain and simple. All right? All right, so let's go on. James chapter 5. Corrupt, self-centered, rich oppressors. Corrupt, self-centered is the point. Rich oppressors. Folks, do you know there's people like that today? That are, are corrupt, <laughs> self-centered, rich oppressors? In fact, you might not know this. All eyes up here and pay close attention, please. You might know it, but our entire world is run by the bankers, the world bankers, okay? World bankers own and operate most countries in the area now, and they're corrupt, okay? Our Federal Reserve, I don't know, I think they're somewhere around 1912. They went out and met secretly out on an island. I think it's Jekyll Island, they call it. It's a book out you can read, where they discovered and matched up with the World Bank and that's called our Federal Reserve Bank. And it is not subject to neither a part of the United States. So that's dangerous because the United States, we have a constitution with a preamble and with bills of rights to protect us that God and righteous men built to keep us protected so that the one world government wouldn't take over. You see... There's two kingdoms. There's a kingdom of darkness and there's a kingdom of light. And as long as there's been man, we know the devil's been working and we know God's been working. Well, the devil's been working to gain control over all countries, all cities, all peoples. That's what he does to turn them away from God. Well, in these last days, it says there's going to be an Antichrist, and he's going to run, have a world religion. He's going to have a world banking system. He's going to run everything. Now, do you remember a fellow named Donald J. Trump? Donald J. Trump kept saying something that most people didn't know. Now, maybe you didn't like his personality, and I'm sorry you threw a president out that was probably the best president we ever had because he was a businessman and he knew the chicanery these corrupted people could handle. But we threw him out. But you know what he said? This is one of the very most important is he says that this is America. It is America first. Because if every country thinks themselves and puts themselves the way God designed, then we'd be a myriad of countries loving and caring for one another because God would help instead of one conglomerated thing by one dictator and a banking system. And a, now we've lost the pharmaceuticals. These creatures have taken over all kinds of things. What creatures is that, Pastor Kerry? The devil and his little minions? They're corrupting. Every perfect gift, every good gift comes from God. If it's not perfect, corrupting, and they're ripping you off, who do you think's doing that? It isn't God. So we got a big problem on our hands, but it's just been prophesied for a thousand, seventeen hundred years. Been telling us about this. 
So rich, corrupt people are wanting to control everything. And their God is not the same God as your and my God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the same God that the pharaohs in Egypt worshipped. The same gods as the Anunnaki were. Same gods of these weird gods in Greece and, and Rome. They all corrupted. Now there were righteous people everywhere, but there were corrupted people. It'd be foolish for us to just go around looking at it. There's corrupt people wanting to control you. So he opens up with that very thing. Even back during James's time. Listen to what he says. All right, let me turn my page. Did I set the stage real good for you there? I hope so, because you are not part of a world conglomerate. And you listen to people, and some of the news, I'll be talking about global this and global that. Don't you dare sign on. We're America first under God. Global nothing. That's how the Antichrist is coming in. Hello? He's the Antichrist, the one world ruler. Not. And we're all asleep, playing religion. Not you guys, though. We're not you guys either. All right. Then he goes on, verse 1. Come now, you rich. Look what he says. Weep and howl, for your miseries are coming upon you. See, they're evil, they're corrupt. Your riches are corrupt and your garments are moth-eating. Are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded. They're corrosion. In other words, it's false. If you got a bad ring on your finger, turn your, your, your finger green. Hello? And corrosive. And will be a witness against you. And it will eat at your flesh. Now he's prophesying here. Like fire. You have heaped up treasure in these last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, you have kept back from them by fraud. Does that sound familiar? Who's keeping things from us? Who's being fraudulent? The people under the rule of the serpent. Amen. Well, I'm sorry. It's the truth. You don't have to be afraid of anything. You're covered in Jesus. How can you learn anything? Hey, listen. Can't be afraid of electricity. You got to use it for your toaster, Bunky. <laughs> All right, so let's go on. All right, this, this is James way back, 45 AD. All right, you have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts in that day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just, and he does not resist you. So evidently there is a group back even at that. Here's what was happening. I know the history. There were some very rich Jewish people that was sold out to the Roman government. They partied with, with, uh, with the Roman emperors and all Pontius Pilate's, all the Pilate's and all. And, and they did all of that and yet they went to church on a Sunday. And they would rip people off, and when people would get murdered and everything, they'd turn their back and they ignore like it didn't happen. It's like abortion today. That is a murder. And let me tell you something about abortion. Have you ever wondered why Satan demands blood? Have you ever wondered why that? You go through all of the societies through history, every society that was raised under the serpent all demanded blood or human sacrifice. It's in history. Check it out. I did. And then most of the old time cities thousands of years ago, why did they have serpents on all of them? Well, let's fast forward up to today. Why can't we get rid of Planned Parenthood and abortion? I mean, we've got government money being sent to take hair off of aborted children and match it onto rats just to see how that works. 
That's sick. That's what Hitler did. Why are we turning our back and, and not protesting and not standing up for God? Because I'm telling you, this group, you can call them whatever you want, they're nothing less than Satan worshipers, and they're giving blood sacrifices every day through these abortion clinics. And you try to remove that blood sacrifice, Satan will rip them head right off. And that's why it's so hard, because Satan has gained control so hard while the church has been sleeping. And here it was happening way back then. Get rid of abortion. Trump was getting rid of abortion. You ever wonder what those little letters were they passed out to certain people at, at George Bush's senior's uh, uh, funeral? Little threatening letters. Probably said, we know what you did back in so-and-so, and we've got pictures of it. If you don't vote our way, we got you. And that stuff's been going on since the killing of Kennedy. You can see that I'm a kind of a dangerous person. Okay? How do you know all that? Because I have inside information, but we won't go past that. So did James. He was a Jew, but he knew that the Jewish people didn't know this. Are you interested? Let's go on. All right, a couple of points I want to bring you, okay? And he says, you have lived and filled yourself. Now you're going to eat of your own condemnation. Point one, what does it profit you if you gain the whole world and lose your own salvation, right? Two, people who have the means but without God have corruption that works on them. You see, Satan wants to control things. So if you got a lot of money, he'd want to control that, right? If you're real beautiful or you're a real sexy looking guy, he'll want to pervert and control that. If you are a person of influence, say a king or a president or a leader of some sort, he's going to want to corrupt that. Why do we think that this stuff doesn't happen? Huh? He starts on you, you know, young kids start punching them out, making them fat and doing things with them and start playing mental games while they're young. They need to have godly parents to raise their children properly. How to ford off some of those weird social injustices you find in school. Moving right along too. So people who have the means but without God are easily corrupted. Thirdly, back then up to the present time, there are those that can pull chains, no people, and can slip money underneath to begin, begin to manipulate certain things. We've seen it, haven't we? The trouble is we can't prove a lot of things. But you know what? When we get there, God's going to sort it all out, and he's going to give out the judgments according to what is done. All right, James, again, chapter 5, verse 7 through 8. Be patient and observant of the times. Everyone say patient, observant. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the produce, the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until he received the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts while you're waiting for God to come. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. A couple of points underneath that. God is bringing in a harvest just like a farmer waiting for the fruit to come. That's why you share Jesus with everybody. How many, how many years have we been praying for God to bring in people? And now we're seeing harvests. So it takes a while for the seed to germinate and things to happen. That's why we continue on. We don't get plopped to and fro. We don't quit in the middle of the process. Can you say amen? And then, so... God is bringing in the harvest like a farmer waiting. And blessed are those watching when I come, he says. Be like the wise virgins. Remember the, the ten virgins, five wives, five foolish. What did the wives do? They did two basic things. They trimmed their lamps and they had lots of oil. What, what did you say, sis? Brought extra oil. Brought extra oil. So they had plenty of oil. Do you know what trimming the lamp does? It makes it brighter. Instead of having the wick real long when you trim it back, 
it makes it brighter with less smoke. Amen? And they had extra oil. So they were prepared. How about you? Are you prepared if the rapture came tonight? Should be. Yeah. And you say, well, I guess I am. Well, you know you are. The only thing that will keep you from rapture is you cursing God when he comes. And you're going to be doing that, are you? <laughs> Do you plan on doing that? Well, okay. Guess what? You're going to go. See, but see the insecurity immediately. I says, in the rapture, you can have him. You stop and pause. Let me tell you something. I'm going to repeat a lot here coming, coming up. As long, now, please don't think I'm picking on anybody. As long as you are ignorant, you're a slave. I said, as long as you are ignorant about who you are in Christ, you're under the bondage of sin and slave because you don't know you're set free and you don't know what to apply when you need to apply it. So ignorance is, keeps us sl slaves. Hello, you slaves to sin. But thank God you and I are not ignorant. Can you say amen? All right, let's go, let's go on. So, blessed are those watching when I come. All right, James chapter 5, starting at verse 9 through 13. God rewards those who endure. Did you know there's an enduring reward? A crown for those that endure till the end? Amen. So just plan on never giving up. You said, what if I just crawl across the finish line? You're going to get it. Doesn't matter. We're heading towards God. Now what we keep forgetting is God is helping us. We keep thinking that we've got to run that race ourselves. Are you kidding? That's why you're, you're slowing down. You took over. Sit back. Buckle up. You on watching camera. Sit back in Jesus. I'm sitting in this chair. Buckle up. Okay, push Jesus forward into the driver's seat and tell him to drive. He just drives your day. You follow along and then God will say, do this, and do your natural routines, but he's in the driver's seat. Do you follow what I'm saying? But as long as we're trying to do it, our energy is limited. So, we need to rest while he moves. So remember this little statement. While you're working, God is stopped and resting. While you are resting, God is working. So you get up in God, sit down in the authority of God, and follow God. It's like getting in your car, and your car takes you to places, but you're the one that steers and brakes. Hello, move it on. So look at this next, verse 9. Do not grumble. I'm hearing too much grumbling on, on the church thing. Don't do that. That church thing is for you to talk about business and scripture, what God's answering for you. Or the prayer line is for not grumbling, but saying, I need help. I had a rough night. Don't go into detail. Say amen, somebody. You just don't do it. You're going to tip the devil off. The devil's not omnipresent. And he's not always around. But you keep on sticking your lip out. He's going to catch it one time. Don't do that. How many times have you heard me? Every sermon I preach is that. Why? Because I'm a pastor that wants the people here to have it. To get it. To experience all of God that they can. So everything I do is to help you to do that. It means I might seem to be a little bit pointy. What do you mean I have to pick up my mess? Well, yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's go on. All right, indeed we, I love this. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endured. You have heard of the perseverance of Job. And see that the end intent by the Lord. He got twice as much, okay? That the Lord is very compassionate and very merciful. Now, why is he talking like that? 
Because Jews believe if anything wrong happened, it was God punishing them. I know a lot of Christians who believe that foolishness too. Anything wrong goes, God's punishing them. That is a lie. Who lives in you now? So why would God punish himself? He will use words, his scripture. He will try to get you into prayer where he can talk to you, but he will not punish you. Now, here's what happens when we don't listen to God. and Keep on, don't listen to God. Keep on not listening to God. Then something will break. Or we might fall and skin ourselves up. And don't be the foolish person to say, oh God, why did this happen to me? Because I'll put my finger right there and say, because you're not listening to God. You don't pray. You don't get in the word. And you keep talking like you do. Satan's going to attack you like you do. And you're not. He, he's hearing what I'm saying. He believes that you're believing it. So when he's coming with tomorrow's temptation, he believes you're going to believe today. And here's where a lot of Christians are. They're not. So what happens? They get hit with something they're not prepared for because they didn't listen the night before. You see, following Jesus is a little bit more listening than anything else. And then doing in faith what you believe you should do. All right, point one, do not grumble at all. 1 Corinthians 10, read it tonight. 1 Corinthians 10. You will bring condemnation on yourself when you do that. God is not into complaining. He's into you believing. Thirdly, the Jews always use things to swear by. Because you're going to see this in here in just a minute. So James chapter 5, the last part of that says... But above all, my brethren, do not swear. <laughs> He's not talking about cussing. But don't cuss either. Either by heaven or earth or by any other oath. But let your yes be what? Yes and your no be no. Lest you fall into, one translation says temptation. The other one says judgment. Okay. So why does Jesus say let your yes be yes and your no be no? Mean what you say, say what you mean. I'm going to be there at 10. Don't show up any other time. Or don't say it like that. Hello. Because what happens is the enemy begins to paint a picture with, now listen, paint a picture of the person that promises and doesn't keep their promise. He paints a picture in everybody's mind that that person is almost worthless because they can't keep their word. That's what Satan does with a person like that. Hello? Either you mean what you say, you say what you mean. Could you imagine what God, would we had a God like that? Denise goes, oh God, I really need help. And he goes, <laughs> okay. And then he doesn't do anything. Well, you know, that's not God. Sounds more like Loki. You know who Loki was? That's another name for the devil. Out of the Samaritan language, the, the Loki, the trickster. All right, so let's move on. <laughs> I got to let some of these little things out once in a while so you guys don't get locked up into religion. All right, so let's go on. Now, ministering to specific need in prayer. This is a very powerful thing we're going to look at here. And I'm going to try to buzz through this last part real quickly, but with all the bells and whistles, okay? James chapter 5 is dealing with the prayer of faith. Verse, uh, verses 13 through 18. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Hey, Carrie, Linda, come to my house. I need prayer. And let them pray over them anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save, heal, deliver, and preserve the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. God will raise them up divinely. And if there is any committing of sins, God will forgive them when the moment the prayer is given. 
So when you pray somebody that prayer of faith over them, whatever they did wrong and caused them to get sick is forgiven. Hello? That's why Jesus, when he spoke the word to his disciples, every time he spoke the word, he says, now you are clean through the word I've spoken to you. See, the word has a natural cleansing effect. It's like water. You wash your hands, don't you? And, and you don't use uh, dirt. Use water, don't you? Yeah, all right. You're catching on. Now, he says, so it says, and any of the prayer, it says, and, and the prayer of faith will save, heal, deliver, set free, and preserve the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. If they've committed sins, they will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another. This does not mean confess your intimate sins. Oh, I've been watching pornography. No, you dummy. It means to confess your fault. I've always been late. Pray for me. That's a fault. I've always did this. Pray for me. Sometimes I come across as I'm a know-it-all. Pray for me. That's what it's talking about, the little things. So everybody knows that everybody has little things we're working on. So we can relax and be healed. But I've seen men's ministries, oh, I'd love to punch them out. They get in there and then they get a book called Men's Secret Sin. And they go through some pornography problem. And half the guys there are going, I don't have that problem. Dumb, dumb, dumbs. You don't deal with secret problems of men. That's for them to deal with God. You keep shoving them to God. You keep going to God. If you've got something really bugging you, you go, go to an elder, but one, not everybody, and get some prayer. But don't launder your dirty underwear But besides God. Why? Because the devil will catch wind of it. He'll put it in the fan and then shoot it all over the congregation. <laughs> Don't you know how the devil works? I'm amazed at people con con always letting the devil come in and slap them around and they go, oh! <laughs> no. Say not no more. All right, so listen. Confess your trespasses one to another. That's your faults. Pray for one another that you be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. Elijah was a man like us. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. It was a judgment of God. God asked him to do that. And then he prayed again and then it began to rain. Folks, when I saw this, I knew I could change the weather. I could pray to God and ask God to change the weather. I can tell you at least a hundred times the weather, God changed the weather because we had a potluck or because we prayed. One time we were standing out in this man's field cutting, trimming his trees and the rain was just coming down. You know how Washington is. It was just coming down thick. We had all our rain stuff out. And this guy was a smart aleck. He comes shoving shoving up, cussing, he says, have your God stop the rain, you sissy Christians, he said, and we're cutting his trees. <laughs> and so my cousin's there, you know, and I says, okay, I will, just like that. God loves that kind of faith. Now, I didn't think I was displaying faith. I was just telling the guy off. So I said, okay, Father, stop the rain. The rain stopped instantly. Just like it was clouds were everywhere and, it, and there was no opening or anything. Just stopped raining. And it was really quiet. And we, Keith and I started praising the Lord and everything like that. The guy came out and he says, I don't believe it. Sl goes back in, slams the door and it starts raining all over again. And, and, he, and then he comes out again. He says, see, I told you. I said, stand right there. I says, God has stopped instantly. The guy fell down on his face. Witnesses watched this on his face and gave his heart to the Lord. So you need to know about what is available to, with your God. Elijah, like, a, like us, can sincerely pray. He stopped the weather. You know the weather man. See, but we're so limited. Oh, with just the, the little Christians. 
Yeah, we're the humble Christian with a big, mighty God. You see, a couple of points and we're done. Number one, when we are suffering, we are to pray. This word for pray means to worship, petition, remind God of what he promised in his word. So if you're sick and stuff, you say, Lord, I worship you. (laughs) I'm thanking you. I praise you. You just keep on doing it. And then the power of God starts sapping you. It's like taking medicine. If you're you're suffering, pray, worship. God will pull you out. Okay, there you go. Two, are we happy? Sing songs. Praise the Lord. Just have a great time. Get carried away. I do it all the time on this property. I'm out here painting. Make it, turn, cranking up the Christian music, you know. People are stopping by, looking and waving now, you know. It's great. I don't care. This is an attractive zone. Let's get them saved. Thirdly, are, are we sick? It says, call for the elders of the church. Don't sit home and think of yourself. The spiritual elders of the church are the spiritual mature. Let them pray over them. The word pray is the same one as before. Supplicate, worship. Remind God of his word over them. Okay? Okay? And pray over them, anointing them with oil. Worship and pray in the name of Jesus over them. Fourthly, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Salvation is a very powerful word. It has about five meanings. It means healed, sound, whole, delivered, made to be preserved. Hello? Hello? It's two Greek words, sozo and soteria. Look it up for yourself, all right? Fifthly, to be open and honest about your faults and shortcomings is to allow no pride to come in and allows you to pray for one another and you be healed. I'm amazed at when I ask somebody why they did something, they got every excuse in the world. Don't give me an excuse. Adam did that. It didn't go over very good. Just say, yeah, I'm sorry. Try that. It's real refreshing. (laughs) Some people, they can't say, I'm sorry. I mean, just check yourself. If you can't say, I'm sorry, and mean it, then work on it. All right? Sism 6.6, Elijah was a man of sincere, compassionate prayer. He could affect the wither, so can you. And many phenomenal things he could do by God, he made axe head floats. He split waters. I mean, he raised the dead. Oh, my goodness. You can do the same. I'm going to tell you something. Maybe you don't know. Maybe my, 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 my relatives and my friends don't know. But there have been three people out that the Lord, through me, have raised from the dead. I didn't, and two of them, I didn't even know what it was. I just figured they needed prayer, and God raised them from the dead. In front of witnesses. Now, I'm not talking about something I might have made up just to impress you by. (laughs) I'm not here to impress anybody. If you go back and you just could videotape my life, it would impress me because I didn't do a thing. So let's move right on. You and I, because we love God, can accomplish many things when we learn to pray. When we learn to put God first in our life. Not what we're doing, but what, how we're meeting with God. You see, God does because he is. Okay. All right, and last point. Love reaches out and restores. James 5, 19 and 20 says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. A couple of quick points. Notice it doesn't say gossip about them or criticize their behavior. Nor does it say anything else that way. It says, turn them back. Our job is to restore one another. You're mad at me and you're justified. Maybe I did do something I didn't mean to. Don't stay mad at me. Come to me and restore me. See? Otherwise, That's about it. You know, you haven't got the guts to do anything. Sit down and learn. 
All right, and second, love covers, doesn't expose. Hey, do you want to hear what so-and-so did? I mean, I've been to pastors' conventions. The pastors are talking about other pastors. I'm thinking, boys, you need to go back to Sunday school. Okay, love covers a multitude of sin. It doesn't expose it. God is love and our Father. Remember how the Father saw the prodigal son from afar off? What did he do? He ran to him. That's how much God loves us. So guess what? We have a real turkey trying to corrupt our government. Keep in prayer, folks. I want you to probably spend five minutes of your prayer time every morning just on the government, just asking God to pluck out, root out, and expose corruption, and then raise up people who will pers- um, prosecute it and judge it, and, and the right people will go to jail. Will you do that? Because there are people that need to go to jail. There can't be two, there are two classes of people anymore. The ones on one side who could always get away with everything and the ones on the other one, you can't even breathe right. Do you follow what I'm saying? It's time to pray. All right, God bless you. I hope you enjoyed the study.